start our webinar on orthodontic surgery case discussion I invite dr joseph edward president amsa kerala to give the welcome address thank you dr aglish a warm good evening to one and all respected moderator dr shang uh, vinod panelists dr shri peter dr suraj dr manoj kumar senior colleague senior members colleagues dear friends we know that we are packed with a couple of programs for the past past one or two one or two months right now i think but all our programs were well attended i think this is means we have a means it is being informative from our point of view so that is why we have this audience now we had a short trial i mean we thought we'll have a short trial which is going to benefit our pgs as well as our practicing professionals for that we thought we will have a topic wise case discussion where that pgs get an opportunity to present a case in front of front of the public or as like a case, exam point of view as well and so that after this the panelist along with the moderator who goes on continuing with it and the panelists with an active discussion will help the professionals also in planning out and working out and discussing the complications regarding all the treatment prospectives and outcomes regarding the same. So I hope this is going to be a trial run in orthognathic and if this is going to be successful then we thought we will have the next sessions in trauma or uh, oncology as well as pathology. and so so that before exam our pgs will get an exposure and we will select pgs from means we will have allotted for each and every institutions for a pg to present it so nobody will lose and i mean at least each one of from each colleges will get an opportunity for this but this i thank each and every uh, the uh, faculties for faculties the moderators for spending the time to support means to be a part of this program provide after with the invitation of what we give to them as well as all the audience who are sub- here to be a part of this program to share their experience and knowledge and their opinions regarding same thank you thank you one and all aglish i think in go ahead brother yes sir abarna you can start sharing the screen we we'll start with the case presentation followed by <coughs> so may i start yeah you please start good evening everyone i am dr abarna snaya finally a post graduate came city gender college I'm here for the case presentation on the diagnosis and treatment planning in orthodontic surgery. As Shushruta explained to our mankind centuries ago, love of life is next to love of our own faces. Facial aesthetics influence our life greatly. The aim of treatment planning is to develop a plan that will maximize benefits to the patient. A 24-year-old male patient reported to our maxillofacial center with complaints of forwardly placed lower jaw since childhood. The patient had complaints of inability to close the mouth, difficulties in speech, degradation since adolescence. The patient had no relevant medical natal growth, personal or family history. 
On general examination, the patient was found to be moderately built, moderately nourished with erect portion and normal gait. The patient had a cooperative attitude and was adequately motivated for the surgical intervention and had no signs of systemic illness and the vitals were stable. We go for qualitative, quantitative examination before uh, coming to the professional diagnosis. So the qualitative uh, examination includes the profile examination and the symmetric examination and also the indices. So initially we go for the maxillofacial examination and cephalic index was found to be dolicocephalic. The nasal index that the patient was leptorine, that the patient had a tall and narrow nose and the facial index, the patient was had a leptoproscopic face. On the frontal examination, the patient's face was symmetrical and the facial midline was parallel to the true vertical. Coming to facial proposal, the face was divided into three, that is three halves, that is uh, from tri uh, trichion to nathion, uh, trichion to glabella, glabella to subnasal and subnasal to menton. In our case, the ratio was 6.5 to 7 to 8. And the lateral one fifth, each uh, face was divided into five equal parts, roughly equal to the width of one eye. And in our case, it was the ratio was 6.5 to 4.5 to 4.6 to 4.5 to 5. Facial examination, the intercanthal distance was found to be about 4 cm. Interpupillary length was found to be 8.5 cm. Palpebral width about 7 mm. The nasal dosum width 2.5 cm. Ala width about 5.5 cm. And upper lip length about 6.5 cm. The profile examination, the, the line was drawn between the soft tissue point of the glabella to the subnasal and subnasal to corneon. And uh, by this analysis, we could find uh, that the facial profile was found to be convex. The facial angles, the nasofrontal angle or the angle in the right uh, was found to be 120 well within the limits of the normal range, 115 to 130 degree. The nasomandal angle of Angle GHC was found to be 124 degree, that is within the range of 120 to 132 degree. The naso lab labial angle was angle DEF, that is about 80 degree, which was very short of the angle, the normal range of 95 to 110 degree, indicative of upper incisor proclination. The mental label sulcus was obliterated, and the cervical mental angle or the angle IJK was found to be 115 degree. Analyzing the nose, the dorsal width was found to be 2.7 centimeter. The ala basal width on the column, as we can see in the diagram in the basal view, was considered to be proportionate and the nasal product, uh, projection was adequate and functionally the nasal F4 was found to be symmetrical. Lip examination, the patient had incompetent lips with the adequate incisal show and the cupid bow architecture had no anomalies and the lip mucosal show was high with upper lip length about 0.7 centimeter. TMJ, the entire incisal opening was about 40 mm, and the patient did not have any eccentric mandibular movements or deviation on mouth opening. The path of closure was normal, and there were no audible or palpable joint sounds in the patient, and the condylar movements were within the normal limits. In speech, the lisping was present, with air escape while saying pa, and no velopharyngeal incompetence was evident. In intraoral examination, we can see the uh, patient had a therapeutic extraction of 3.8 and 4.8 prior, six months prior to the surgery with adequate oral hygiene. And the patient had a class 3 malocclusion with anterior open bite and reverse overshot. The tongue was large and forwardly placed. Coming to investigations, we go for facial photographs and also uh, radiological investigations. This is the facial photographs. And radiological investigation, we went for a lateral cephalogram uh, and uh, OPG and CBCT. We then performed a cephalometric analysis, which is the quantitative anal analysis part. And in cephalometric analysis, we analyze the skeletal based relationships and dento valvular relationships. And we analyze the landmarks uh, in sagittal, vertical, and transverse planes. In the sagittal skeletal based relationships, uh, we used a McNamara analysis. This we drew a uh, true uh, nation perpendicular through which is passing through the nation and uh, bisecting the uh, FH plane. And by McNamara analysis, we could see that point B was quite ahead of the uh, nation perpendicular, indicative of a mandibular prognathism. And by Strenner's analysis, 
uh, the angle A and B was less than one degree, again suggestive of the skeletal craft tree, as the normal range lies between two to four degree. In size relationship, we went for a mid-phase mandibular length differential. That is, we drew a line from condylon. Uh, to the point ANS, and uh, we show the uh, midfacial length, and again a line from the nation to the condylon. We show the mandibular length, and we subtracted each other these two lengths, and the value we got was about thirty-eight mm, where the normal adult range lies somewhere between twenty-nine to thirty-three mm, which was indicative of a mandibular prognathism. Sagittal dentovalvular relationships. As we can see, uh, the inclination of the maxilla in, the maxillary incisor as it intersected various horizontal planes uh, and the angle formed by this intersection was quite greater than the normal values, indicating of the proclation incisor. By uh, and also in the mandibular uh, incisors, the long axis of the mandibular incisors intersecting the mandibular plane was found to be greater, again, indicative of proclination of the mandibular incisors. And also, the sagittal position of the mandibular incisors was uh, forwardly placed. The vertical skeletal relationships by Sanoni's analysis, we can see that the convergence of facial planes was found in front of the occiput, which indicative of increased uh, vertical facial height. And uh, anterior and posterior facial height coming to that, the mid facial anterior facial height and uh, lower anterior facial height, that is the uh, points between nation, ANS, and ANS and menton. The ratio, the normal ratio was considered to be 45 is to 55, but in our case, the, it was found to be 44 is to 73, which again indicative of the lower, uh, increased lower uh, facial height, FHI or uh, FHI value, which lies in the normal range of 0.65 to 0.75. In our case, it was 1.48, again, indicative of vertical skeletal discrepancy, suggestive of an anterior open bite. The vertical dentovalvular relationships, the inclination of the occlusal planes. Uh, no, in a normal case, the uh, occlusal planes of the maxilla and mandible should coincide, but in our case, there was uh, inclination of the occlusal planes, again suggestive of an occlusal cant, and the mandibular dental height was high, indicative of an increased vertical chin height. The transverse skeletal relationships, we didn't find any uh, significant facial asymmetry. Again, we found a CBC on this uh, coming to the professional diagnosis, uh, the patient had an maxillary deficiency with vertical maxillary excess, mandibular prognathism, skeletal class 3 malocclusion with anterior open bite. And this was more evident by taking a three-dimensional view using CBCT. And the problem list is a retroded maxilla, prognathic mandible, occlusal cant, increased maxillary vertical height, increased anterior vertical height, so this is open bite. And uh, coming to a treatment planning. Manav sir, if you could intervene. I think we'll stop for the time being till here and we'll go back to the treatment planning part. So. You can just grab the slide with the patient's photographs. Yeah, now I think we'll just discuss roughly this case. Now to the panelists, anything you need to know more? Anything, uh, any concerns you have regarding the photographs, the investigations done? Anything? Suraj, start with you. I think uh, Dr. Atabla has presented the case pretty comprehensively. Yeah. I, I think uh, I would be satisfied with the investigations she's had. Uh, I would have loved to see uh, uh, models, but I think uh, she is making it with CBCT. Uh, so, all in all, I think it's very satisfactory. Okay. I hope uh, it is to the other panelists also. Do you, need to, do you want to add anything to this? Edward? Yeah, I think she's come uh, covered all the relevant documents I and mean, required things of what has to be done. Okay. So uh, let us assume that this is a, a, a one patient with uh, uh, self-motivated and there are no medical issues with this patient. And uh, of course, we would have liked to see, like uh, Suresh pointed out, 
model of these spaces. And uh, the basic treatment planning would involve uh, model and uh, model surgery. So I think model, because I think she had planned this using virtual planning, that is the reason maybe she has not shown those models. But again, that photos also could have helped a little bit. Yeah, okay. Then any concerns the panelists have regarding the problem list? Just put up the problem list once more on the slide. Problem list, yeah. You can put up the problem list. Okay. Okay. <coughs> maxilla, prognathic mandible, occlusal can, uh, occlusal can, then increased maxillary vertical height, increased anterior vertical height in the open bite. Well, it is a problem list. Uh, so to start off, uh, how much should we depend on cephalometric? How much is the clinical investigation examination? This is opinion from uh, the panelists. Start with Manoj. Uh, we have followed. Am I audible? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, we have followed the digital planning. Uh, for any cases, we have uh, considered the symmetry, balance, and proportion projections, everything you have to consider. The problem list uh, already explained here. And okay. uh, preliminary, uh, we have done the treatment plan based on the cephalometric analysis. And uh, we have uh, done the CBCT of uh, one, one mm slice in uh, DICOM format and send the images of the maxillofacial skeleton and also scanning the occlusal surface of the uh, max, uh, occlusal plane of mandible and maxilla and also photograph was taken and uh, we, have, we have sent the data. Data collection is very important and send the data to the vendor that is uh, we have usually sent to the CETAS Chennai. Uh, they are doing the composite, uh, creating the composite images, uh, composite models that is called registration by superimposing and aligning the, these images. And using this, these are the composite models. By using these composite mm -hmm. models, we can do the virtual surgeries. The advantage of the virtual surgical planning uh, over the uh, conventional planning is, since the maxillofacial skeleton is a 3D structures. So uh, when you do the surgery, simulate the surgery, CASS, computer assisted surgical simulation, we can three-dimensionally mobilize even the minimal rotation and also the, if there is any can, minimal can't, everything, everything uh, we can, rotational moment, everything we can do by using the virtual planning. And thank you, Pandur. What is your this uh, virtual planning? Is there any limitations for virtual planning? Question to me. Excuse me. Shango, is it addressed to somebody who means in the plan whom specific or it's open? Hello? Hello, the question was to Hello. Dr. Suraj. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, I'll take that. Uh, to be frank, I don't have much uh, experience with this uh, computerized uh, uh, three dimensional planning. I always used to make do with uh, by models, model surgery, and uh, preparing the intermediate and final sprints and going about it. But looking at, uh, looking at uh, the treatment more uh, planning with the computers, I think it was fairly comprehensive and it. Uh, uh, makes your life so much more easier. And I think it also reduces the amount of uh, uh, errors that might be when you're doing model surgery. So I think this is the way to go, certainly the way to go in the future. Okay. Sherry, can you add something on the uh, on digital treatment planning? 
I, I, sorry, I have a different take on this. Uh, I personally feel that everybody should be well versed with the manual planning very well. Um, I don't, I don't think anybody should go away from this, uh, this thing, uh, this uh, program, thinking that virtual planning is the, is the only thing because uh, yeah. there are a lot of defects for virtual planning, at least at this moment of time. Like, for example, uh, if you move a segment and it is hitting somewhere, that means if there is an interference, um, yeah. if you do just an ordinary virtual planning, virtual planning is in different levels. Um, uh, if you don't have a tactile sensation of moving these things, the interference will not be felt. In surgery, you... Yeah. Not audible. Dr. Shari is not oh, audible. Shari is not audible. Yeah. Okay. We'll just wait for a second. I think it is not with the uh, net connection. There's a problem with the Zoom actually. So many people are getting it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My uh, suddenly yeah, yeah. everything went mute. Ah, yeah, everything went mute. My Zoom, I think uh, it showed that I have left and then I'm still in. So there's something happening with the Zoom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, I think uh, the, what Shari is trying to say is that because there are a lot of PGs and all there in the group that we need to. Sangha, by the uh, time I'll take over, I'll just continue. Yeah, yeah, you can add. Something, yeah, you yeah. can add. The thing is. Yeah. Um, virtual planning, of course. So for you to plan a case, you need to have different options for that. But basically, if you're going to give it for a virtual planning also, you need to know exactly when a patient comes to you, when you, you yourself have to plan it properly. And for that, we have our own manual, as Dr. Sherry was telling about the manual options of treatment planning. We have our self analysis on which you initially asked on. Self is most important because we okay. need to know exactly. We'll have to do the self tracing. We'll have to get an idea of where your problem lies, either the maxilla, the mandible, or if it is a bija which is having a problem. And based on that, having this interpretation in mind, and when you are going to plan your thing, you you are supposed to have something in your mind of what you are planning to do or what the patient really has. And when you, with the help of the virtual planning, if you're going to give it to the people who are working behind it. You have different options in mind of what is the, where the problem is and how it has to get corrected. So once you transfer these images over there, and when you don't leave it to them to decide on what treatment they are going to give you. Instead, you let you know your treatments, you know the problem list, you know where the problems are with the self analysis. So you tell them, you give your suggestions and ask them to design or uh, give it accordingly back to you with the uh, virtual planning and then yeah. get in and if, uh, if it is not agreeable for means uh, or if you think that they have a better option or they have some more you can add on to it or something which you can get it back from them and then you come okay. to your conclusion that whether what can be done and that is what i think self should be a must for all and everybody has to do a self and get to know what exactly the where the problem yeah. lies and how it has to yeah, we get your point. Yeah, uh, so just can you briefly take us to the conventional method of planning in this case? It's a by your procedure, obviously, some things are needed. If it was conventionally, can you briefly take us through that? So please. Uh, excuse Suresh, me, Dr. Shankar. Dr. Sherry is in, I think. Okay, okay. Sherry, uh, yeah. Sherry, you were saying something. Yeah. Can you continue, please, regarding digital treatment planning, the limitations? Dr. Shari. Mm, that is 100 participants right now, Dr. Shari. Okay. Hello. No problem with Dr. Okay. Dr. Okay. Okay. Uh, Suraj, can you take okay. through the okay. conversation? 
the conventional, uh, the old fashioned way, as uh, we used to do, is we go by the acronym CCPRF. That is, we take uh, case history, the other C is case examination, P is plaster pass, R is radio wash, and F is patient photo wash. So these are the five main things that you take before you embark upon doing any case. And depending upon the complexity of the case, when you have babies, uh, to put you uh, uh, to give you a general picture, you take you uh, uh, so uh, all these things. You make models, and then you articulate model with the help of uh, uh, you do a Facebook transfer to uh, articulate it to a single adjustable articulator. You relate the maxilla and the mandible with the help of uh, the crucial laser, and then you try to simulate the model cuts. And uh, try try to move uh, move the when you try to do a mock surgery, try to move the man, mandible and the maxillary segments in the way that you desire them to be in the final thing. And if it is a two-job procedure, you try to do one. So usually, I, I try to make the maxillary uh, movement first. Uh, try to make the intermediate split, then accomplish the final result with the help of mandibular movement and the final split. So that is yeah. it. Yeah, it's just uh, this being a bio procedure. Uh, you need a semi adjustable articulator to articulate the model, and uh, model surgery is that intermediate spin, and then you have a final spin, and you go to the OT with the final spin, hoping that the uh, the the surgery, the mock surgery that you did, uh, are, can, you can simulate that onto the patient using the the spin. That is essentially what we do with the uh, conventional. Uh, treatment planning part. Now, with digital planning, has got its differences. I, I don't know if uh, Sherry Sir is back. Is Sherry back? Uh, hello? 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 Yes, Sherry is back? Yes. Dr. Sherry? Hello? Yeah, yeah, sir. yeah, sure. Can you take it? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so, so is it clear? Yes, yes. yes. You are talking about the limitations of digital. Yeah, I, sorry, sorry about the confusion. Anyway, uh, what I was trying to say is uh, that if, when you do a virtual planning on the computer, you don't get especially interferences. Like, for example, when you're doing a LIFO one, your posterior part of the palate is, is the problematic area because you like say you're impacting it. It hits the posterior part. So if you don't yeah. correct it correctly, you can't do a LIFO one correctly. Final position will be uh, this. When you do an, in a virtual planning, you don't really feel you can move it the way you want it anywhere you want it. The interference will not be filled unless the person who is planning has a haptic device. Uh, yeah. which is a feedback system. So those are not available for an individual. So the, the, you can move the computer wherever you want to, the segments on the computer. But the same thing can be done if you do a 3D printing and cut the segment and move it for, forward and backward, you can get this interference correctly. So uh, this is at different levels. Virtual planning is at different, different, different levels. So I think uh, people should not go from these talks saying that all you got to do is just scan it and send it to somebody and then they give you all the splints and stuff like that. I don't think that that's the way to take it forward. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And what images are best for virtual planning? Is it the CT or the uh, CT? Is there any difference in the DICOM images generated by CBCT or by CT? Yeah. Question is to... Yeah, 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 yeah. CBCT obviously will be more difficult to manage when you want to do this. Uh, but okay. if you're sending it to somebody who knows how to manipulate the images, it doesn't matter. But if you're doing it yourself, uh, CBCT will be more difficult than doing it on a regular CT. Regular CT is much easier to do it uh, because the, the amount of soft tissue which you need to uh, subtract will be more difficult on a CBCT. So that's much easier to take a regular CT. Now, uh, but when you talk about uh, the, the reproduction of the cuspal tips, 
uh, the regular CT is really bad. The reproduction is bad. So, so if you want to make a splint, a CBCT will be much better to make a splint. Alternatively, you just like uh, Dr. Manoj has explained, uh, just like what they have done, they've scanned the occlusal surface and merged the, the occlusal surface scan with the CT scan. So that now the, the, the occlusal surface scan will give you high resolution pictures and the cusps will be reproduced. So your okay. splint will be near accurate. Okay. Uh, can you tell us something about how to, how to uh, give the soft tissue draping to these models, you know, because what we are seeing is all skeletal tissue and we all know that soft tissue doesn't always follow the skeletal uh, things as we move the bones forward and backwards. So how do we factor right. in that change? Right. Uh, you know, in a routine way, if you look at it, what we are doing as in a routine way is to uh, know the ratio between the hard tissue moment to the soft tissue moments in different axes. Yes. That gives us for one millimeter moment of the lip for one, what, how much does the upper lip move? What is the ratio? The same ratio is extrapolated into the 3D uh, environment. So it's not a 2D moment. It's a 3D moment, which has a different value. Some are different. So this is incorporated. I'm not able to hear. Yeah. Okay. We just wait for Sherry. Meanwhile, I think what you're trying to say is that you have to factor in the changes, the soft tissue changes that you'd expect when you move the skeletal tissue. You have to factor in or accelerate that changes into the, your treatment planning. So when you advance it, we know that the lip, the lip may be the, it is less. Uh, maybe that also you have to factor. Now, is Sherry back in? Yeah. Uh, Dr. Shankar, can I ask uh, Dr. Manoj? Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, uh, Dr. Manoj, you said that uh, you had uh, into, uh, you had scanned the occlusal surface of the teeth. Did, okay. uh, did you do a CT scan of the occlusal surface of the models or did you use an intraoral scanner to scan the occlusal surface of the teeth in the patient's mouth? We are uh, usually do the uh, take the impression uh, of the cast and send the cast for uh, scan uh, at the CBCT scan of the occlusal surface of the. Uh, it, uh, we are doing regularly the CBCT scan of the occlusal surface of the study model. Okay. And, and we can also use the scanner scanner for uh, scanning the uh, occlusal surface if the scanner is available. Okay. okay. We are regularly doing the uh, take the impression and uh, okay. preparing the model and uh, do the CBCT images of the. Okay. 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 Now, uh, now, just for discussion sake, we are just uh, we are taking up these cases just for this. We are not questioning what somebody has done or how it is. We are just for just for purely for discussion sake. I think how will we decide on the position of the maxilla? Uh, I think there is a vertical axis of the maxilla and uh, uh, I think it was impacted. So how can we uh, reach that decision? How much to impact? Whether do we need to move this forward? How do we decide on the final position of the maxillary incisors in the horizontal as well as the vertical plane? That uh, uh, somebody, uh, Edward, you want to take that? Yeah, um, the thing is, it basically depends upon once you have your self analysis, you exactly know how much of your maxilla is protruded up and how much of your mandible is protruded. Or is there a, is any one of the job which is going to be in a normal limit? If you have your maxilla uh, in a protruded position and you have your mandible in a protruded position, where if or if any one seems to be in a normal limit, there is always a limitation for you to advance your maxilla. So, so suppose you have to advance your max means if your discrepancy if your maxilla is short by somewhere around more than uh, eight millimeters of deficiency means uh, deficiency is there, and your mandible is also a bit elongated. 
means of okay. protrude yeah you okay. can't okay. advance the match to the to the whole le- length of it where okay. you have yeah. to compromise yeah tell me okay okay suraj yeah i think you want to add something to that yeah uh, what was the question again can you yeah yeah how do you how do you how do you position the maxilla how to decide on the incisal position of the maxilla in the anteroposterior plane as well as in the vertical plane how do you decide on it clinically you have to decide you know the position of the maxilla you want to pick it yeah, yeah so i think that's a vertical leg yeah. uh, i would uh, i would take uh, into consideration the cephalometric values as well as the clinical presentation of the patient okay Uh, uh the ideal position of the maxilla incisor would be uh, uh, that the patient would have a pleasing smile and the, the amount of incisal show is within normal limits that is about 1 to 2 mm of gingival show should be there when the patient is smiling uh or will you take it in before uh, or it should, be, it should be competent in the anteroposterior plane so that would be my uh, maxillary position and the mandible have to follow suit okay and uh, uh what are the things that can influence the position of the uh, the uh, the incisal show to see if the if the lip is short if that also can be a, it can affect the uh, it could the it could be a short upper lip or could be a long upper lip if the incisal show is very small is uh, very limited so the length of the upper lip the anteroposterior position of the maxilla the length of the maxillary denture base all these things uh, even uh, the kinetics of the movement of the upper lip some, some patients will have hyperkinetic upper lip so when they smile even though the upper lip is of sufficient length if the gingival show would be too much so all these things would go uh, as to how the okay. patient uh, how much okay. of the so, yeah okay so it is a combination of uh, cephalometric as well as the clinical presentation okay in this case i think uh, there was a vertical axis vertical maxillary axis and so they have done a differential impact then so uh, manoj can you take us through how did you decide on this uh, differential impact then why was it done can you shed some light on it manoj yes according to analysis uh, the occlusal surface should be a uh, line should be uh, coincide but uh, there is an angulation form in the posterior occlusal surface so that that is an indication of the cant uh okay. cant actually that is why we have decided a uh, 6 mm posterior impaction and 4 uh, mm anterior impaction okay uh, uh, and now my question is to uh, edward intraoperatively how can you measure this value is it possible to measure it intraoperatively whether you have taken it up 6 mm posteriorly or Four millimeters anteriorly. If so, from where would you do the measurement? How will you do it? Uh, initially, before I think, um, uh, what when we before we plan our cuts itself, we'll have to make sure that we do the specific marking. But occasional mistake, what we does is usually when we do the markings, we just trim, keep on trimming so that. the work cut as well as the, uh, the level of markings usually gets lost so normally if you plan for a for means if, if it is a different differential impaction of maxilla by 4 mm and mandible boss uh, means uh, see maxilla anterior by 4 mm and posterior by 6 mm was that what dr manoj just said right okay yeah so so specifically i think we'll have to stick on to whatever means the measurements of what we have marked initially and just keep it as such otherwise we would go wrong in impact at the same time if you are doing doing an anterior advancement also at the same time we we'll have to make sure that there is a bit of variation going to come up in this particular aspect of when we are going to impact it okay and posteriorly uh, I think, yeah i think uh, sir sir is back sir can you hear us yeah i can hear you very well Can, yeah. can you? Sherry, uh, we can hear you. Sherry, we just wanted to know yeah. when, there is, when you are taking into consideration differential impact of the maxilla, how we, how can we, we intraoperatively make these measurements? Any reference points? How can we measure this? Whether what you have intended, you have achieved uh, uh, on the table. 
Right. Um, yeah. One, one way of doing it is the usual way uh, we do it is we put a pin in the nasion region and measure from the pin down to the to the orthodontic wire uh, because once you Hmm. Okay. okay, I think uh, Shelly is having problems with connectivity. So one way of doing it is to have a reference point, especially in the nation region, or sometimes some of the people use even the uh, medial canter ligament as a reference point. And uh, that can be used to measure up to the incisal edge or up to the uh, level of the uh, orthotic brackets and towards the canine and also to the uh, molar region. So you have three, four reference points. So you know that whether what you have achieved, the, uh, what you have set out in the beginning, that is one way of checking it. Also, you can have other reference points also in the part of the maxilla, which you are not planning to, uh, above the cut. You can take measurements from there also, so that you know whether you have pushed up the maxilla to the level that you want to. That is also one way of doing it. So um, in this case, I think it's a bijaw procedure where uh, maxillary inclusion was done. And uh, now my question is, how do you decide whether to do the maxillary surgery first or the mandibular surgery first? Uh, uh, Manoj, can you tell us what is the uh, is the maxillary uh, first, uh, maxillary uh, first uh, we are usually following the maxillary surgery first and yeah. uh, uh, and by using the intermediate slim uh, spin yeah. after, then do the uh, mandible second surgery okay, okay. Uh, so I any, is there any indication for cases in which you do the mandibular surgery first any not in this case, but any situations where you might do the mandibular surgery first? Uh, usually do the maxillary surgery first, uh, because uh, from what I have understood is that there, uh, there's very little difference as to whether you do the maxillary surgery first or the mandibular surgery first, provided you have two splits and terminated the final one. So it has been my practice to do the uh, mandibular cuts, cuts first, not split the ma mandible, go for the maxilla, split the maxilla, move the maxilla, fix it in the desired position with the help of intermediate splints, and then do the, come back to the mandible and do the maxilla, mandibular movements and fix it. So I think that works in majority of the cases. Uh, okay. I would do a mandibular surgery first. Uh, I think uh, it would uh, it depend on cases where you don't have too much of, uh, you, you do not have a very dependable intermediate split. I think uh, I might do the mandibular surgery first. But there's very little to go for uh, changing the procedure that I use in Okay. Yeah. Can I add on something? Yeah, I yeah. add on something? <clears throat> Uh, yes, yes. See, then uh, I think what what we practice or means about um, uh, we do is uh, when we have a bijaw, actually we plan it for the maxillary surgery first, but initially we plan up the surgery with the mandibular surgery. That is, we put in, if it is a by, uh, by a BSSO, we put in the incisions, uh, soft tissue incisions as well as the mandibular by BSSO cuts. Keep, uh, make the cuts and keep uh, keep everything ready and we don't do a split actually we just pack it up leave it uh, if there is any bleeding anything just just get control of it by packing it and then without splitting okay. it off we just go so that the mandible is still stable in a single i mean go back oh, yeah. I can, go up to i get right i think that was what suraj is trying to say but yeah. there are some certain situations like where there's severe hypoplasia of the maxilla in the left patients and all there is there are some it was just says there are some indications in which you do a mandibular surgery first. And also in cases, I think, where you do extra oral surgery of the mandible for advancement in certain situations, there are some indications even that for mandibular surgeries to be done. Okay, that is fine. I just have a doubt either uh, would you go due to a pterygoid extension or a trimble modification? The question is to uh, Suraj. 
I do neither. Uh, I don't do a, a triple modification, neither do a formal uh, split. What I do is I take the post posterior cuts really down uh, yeah. beneath the level of the pterygoids and th then just use the split spreader to spread it out. And usually, and in all the cases, it usually comes uh, at this time. But so there is no need for, uh, as, yeah, at least in my hands, there is no need for a formal uh, pterygoid distinction or a triple modification. Okay, Sherry, are you back? <clears throat> Sherry? Not. Yeah? Dr. Okay. Shangar, can I ask you a question? Me? Yeah. Uh, what is the posterior reference point you people take when you do a differential uh, impaction of the maxilla? Anterior, Sherry told, but what are the posterior landmarks you try to look into? So no. Also, to take measurement. Uh, yeah. Uh, Sherry, you're back. Yeah, I'm back. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Can you just continue with the reference point? Here? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Question like Prashant is asking, posterior yeah. is going to be difficult. Yeah, it is, yes. You can use the posterior, like the molar tube or something, to uh, use it for the posterior, but it is unreliable when compared to the anterior point. So you're taking a posterior point on the Lefort one segment. To the anterior anterior point which you have put on the forehead, uh, you can do that. Uh, I usually do that, but it's not reliable. Yeah. So that is exactly you, why you. Uh, that is where the uh, the role of the. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So suppose you take a reference point high up in the maxilla in the posterior region in the buttress region. Uh, you're not advancing the maxilla, maybe you will get a certain idea. But if you're changing the maxilla, bringing it forward again, there are issues with that. So uh, that is also an alternative you can use. Can I, can uh, I add, please? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, as uh, Dr. Shari said, posture is difficult. But then yeah. there are, uh, two things that you, uh, I think uh, one can do. One is uh, you can make, you can measure the cuts uh, that you place in the posterior maxilla. And you can yeah. show the upper cut and the lower cut. And exactly in this case, you can make a, a cut which are separated by six millimeters. The problem okay. is there is some something of telescoping of the maxilla. So yes, yes. it's not an accurate uh, indicator. It's just an indicator. Indicator, yeah. Yes, yes. That is the main That's issue with the posterior part of the maxilla. Yeah, but because of the telescope. The second thing is that you can uh, use an accurate uh, splint, and if the splint seats, you can be fairly sure that you have gained that much amount of intrusion or that much amount of movement. Yeah, I think we are through with the time for this case. So I think we'll just see the treatment, what has been done. If, uh, doctor, can you just show us the, how this was done? Can you take us to the treatment? <coughs> Aparna? So you want the uh, treatment planning images or the final? The last, the last part. I think they have the treatment done post up. Do they have it? If they have it, they can just show it here. If it is there, that last part. Hmm. In drop photos, are there? Yeah, yeah. I think. I think you have. Yeah, you can just run it post up. Yeah. Okay. 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 Anything else uh, the panelists want to add regarding this case? Because we have stopped the time for this case. So uh, this is a bijaw procedure, the maxilla and the mandible. No. Maxillary inclusion was done. Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. Sherry, yeah. Sherry, please come. Uh, please tell us you are saying something about the uh, reference point. Um, yeah, uh, like, like I said before, I think, uh, yeah, I think uh, Suraj has already elaborated on that. The telescoping is the challenge in the posterior. Okay. Okay. Uh, and what, and uh, the splint, what splint is the way to go, especially okay. uh, we are talking about impaction. Uh, sometimes if you want to do a counterclockwise rotation, you have to bring the PNS okay. down, yeah. creating a gap in the posterior. So all these things are highly unreliable uh, if you make a measurement. Because, uh, it, like, it's, like you said, I explained before, if you impact it, that measurement goes out of control if you tell it, if it telescopes. 
sometimes yes. that point which you have marked disappears into the telescope yes, yes, yes. Um, and uh, then you you can't even know where you're going so i think the key to the posterior part is still the the splint so that is why the splint is extremely important and that is why right. models are important yeah can you just tell us uh, whether it's the pterygoid distinction or would you do a triple modification question is directed yes. to me yes sir yeah i i the way i look at it is i would do both in two different conditions in a regular situation if you want to i want to impact or uh, bring it forward uh, or something like that i would still go for the regular way of distancing the pterygomax uh, so for the tuberosity from the uh, the plates suppose okay. if i want to push back um, i i would take, do a tremble because i get that kind of gap to move the maxilla backward which is unusual uh, okay. uh, i i would do a push back in a very very rare situation because i'm really worried about the airway which i'm going to affect so if if i want to make go take the maxilla back i would I do a tremble take that piece from the uh, the extraction socket to that tuberosity the entire tuberosity portion i would take it out so that i have a quite a big distance to take the maxilla back that's what i would i would look at between the two procedures there's one more question sorry just uh, in this case uh, how do you how will you position the uh, proximal the condyle in its position before doing the plating for the eps how to technique do you use right uh, what i usually do is um, i get the, i put the splint in wire the dentate segment in and then uh, use uh, i have a, a periosteal elevator with a notch on on it which is okay. very similar to the instrument which you used to reposition what is shown in uh, most of the textbooks as a repositioning instrument so this has got a notch it looks like a neck uh, tip uh, in a uh, snake's tongue you push it on onto the uh, the vertical limb of the sagittal split and push it back gently and use my, one of my fingers in the angle outside to push the cor cor corner apart up and rest it into the posterior most and the superior most position now in this position i hold it like that and see whether there is any interference from the dentate segment inside if i have to have uh, if there is an interference i would release this trim off that part so that there is no interference and i am seating it gently without any pressure into it into the final position now once i got my final position i usually mark two with a pencil two parallel marks on this segment because i don't want this segment moving into a new position while the plating is going on okay oh. and uh, another thing which i use is i usually use a transbuckle approach uh, to put the screws in so that i am not when i am pushing and putting the screws in or moving doing any force it is all lingually direct okay not downward and backward because if you are trying okay. to plate intra orally downward and okay. backward and you are not extremely careful you might displace the condylar segment a little down so here okay. i am going totally buckly and the force is lingually placed that's how i okay. do it okay okay i think uh, we have passed the time limit for this case i think can we go to the next case yeah please yeah. manoj you want to add ah, something can i add something uh, regarding the lefort one postotomy Yeah. Uh, for PG trainees, uh, yeah. you have to mobilize the maxilla in a proper and passive position regarding for the uh, proper positioning of seating of the cusp. Otherwise, there is a chance of the condylar uh, position not correct, and that will lead to malocclusion. After relieving the inner maxilla fixation, will lead to malocclusion. So, okay. completely yeah. mobilize the maxilla and judicious removal of the uh, posterior. uh so the bond so that uh, we can passively place the maxilla we can avoid this okay. complication okay i think uh, can we go to the next uh, case uh, just okay. one question dr sanjay one question to dr manoj yes yeah, can you please what was done for the maxilla in this case what was done for the maxilla in this case setback in this case ah in this case uh, advanced method Yeah, because in the treatment plan she has written setback. That was totally confused. Yeah, maxillary advancement. Intrusion, intrusion. 
no no she has she has written sent back i that's what i read maybe i'm wrong ah, uh, okay. hmm. actually for military advancement advancement was done okay okay okay, okay. okay. Hmm. okay. and the sent back was the sent back by how many millimeters was done 9 mm fine can we go to the next case please 9 o'clock yeah could you start sharing the screen yes sir yeah. sir am i audible sir yes very clear yes, yes, yes. please go to full screen <laughs> respected dignitaries and your participants a warm good evening to one and all I'm truly grateful to present this case of asymmetry, which was beautifully corrected by my teacher at our center. Um, our patient is a 23-year-old gentleman who came with a complaint of difficulty in chewing and deviation of the face towards the right side. Uh, he noticed this deviation of the face towards the right side since five years, which gradually increased to the present clinical scenario for which he consulted a dentist and started orthodontic treatment he had a difficulty in chewing since 19 years of age he had been undergoing orthodontic treatment since 7 years and had undergone prophylactic extraction of all third molars he had no comorbidities no drug allergies no similar history in his family no prenatal or postnatal history noted and he had no history of habits or other personal history on general examination the patient was mesomorphic well built well nourished and with normal gait he had no signs of pallor ictus cyanosis clubbing or lymphadenopathy and his vitals was within normal limit on profile examination he had a concave profile and was anteriorly divergent Extraoral examination reveals mesocephalic uroprosopic face, and there was gross facial asymmetry with deviation of the mandible towards the right side and deviation while mouth opening also. And lateral excursion was more towards right side, that is twelve millimeters, and restricted towards left side about eight millimeters. There was a clicking sound while palpating on the right TMJ region. on evaluating the facial thirds there was increased lower one third facial height and decreased middle third height and deviation of midline towards right side the patient had a class 3 malocclusion on the right side and angles class 1 malocclusion on the left he was skeletal class 3 and he had a reverse overjet scissor bite on the right side and cross bite on the left the dental midline was shifted for about 6 mm towards the right side he had been undergoing the orthodontic treatment while at the time of presentation to our clinic he had a severe shift of midline and cross bite we proceeded with uh, cephalometric analysis the cox and the grammans analysis were done in the cox analysis the na pog value was increased which indicated a uh, concave profile decreased na indicative of retrusive maxilla increased nb indicative of man protrusive mandible and increased n pog value indicative of prominent chin n ans value was also decreased which indicates decreased middle third facial height and n pns decreased which indicated Uh, decreased posterior maxillary height and ANS snathion value increased which indicated increased lower third facial height the gonium pogonian value in increased which indicated class 3 malocclusion and pns ans decreased which indicated the total maxillary length was decreased the 
SNB value was decreased, which indicated prognathic mandible, and the ANB was negative, which indicated again indicated mandibular prognathism. On the frontal analysis, we got a vertical maxillary discrepancy of 4 mm, that is, the occlusal cant was about 4 mm, and the and the, uh, the distance from the mid sagittal reference plane to the antigonal nose on both sides showed a dis discrepancy of 10 mm. So the midline was deviated about 10 mm according to the cephalometric analysis. This, uh, so the summary of the analysis was maxillary retru maxilla retrusive by 3.8 mm, mandible protrusive by 15 mm, and the chin was prominent by 14.7 mm, middle third facial height decreased by 8.7 mm, posterior maxillary height decreased by 6.2 mm, maxillary length decreased by 17 mm, lower third facial height increased by 4.2 mm, mandibular body length increased by 7.9 millimeter, midline shifted towards right side by 10 millimeter and occlusal canth towards the right side by 4 millimeters. CT films were taken which clearly showed the midline deviation and also the hyperplastic condyle on the right side. The patient was sent for technician 99 scan which uh, suggested actively growing left condyle. Coming to the problem list, the patient had an actively growing condyle. He was complaining of the facial asymmetry. According to the CEP analysis, he had prognathic mandible, retruded maxilla. He also had malar deficiency, angles class three malocclusion on right side and angles class one malocclusion on left. He also had an occlusal can was diagnosed with left unilateral condylar hyperplasia. The objectives of the treatment were to treat condylar hyperplasia to fix skeletal discrepancy and to correct the malocclusion and aesthetic requirements of the patient. Joseph, sir. Yeah, just hold on. Hold on for the... Shangu, yeah, should yeah. continue or...? No, no, we'll just wait there. Yeah. Just, uh... Uh, to the panelists, uh, is there some clarity? I think uh, it does look like a uh, facial asymmetry due to a unilateral condylar hyperplasia. So uh, is there anything else you need to know to the panelists? Uh, Sherry, do you want to know something? Anything else? Uh, no, I'm, I'm fine. I think the assessment is quite good. Okay. Uh, Suraj? I think uh, I would like to know the status of the mandible, I mean, of the condyle, still whether it is growing or not. So, se sequential uh, uh, technician object scans. I think it is, I'm sure it's coming uh, uh, in, the, in the course of the presentation. Okay. And uh, um, Manoj, anything else you need to know? Any other thing you want to? It's fine. It's fine. Fine. Okay. Okay. So, uh, Edward, I think Edward knows. Uh, can you yeah. just tell us something about the SPECT scan for this patient? Can you just add some light on the SPECT scan? Yeah, the, yeah. The, um, technician bone scan was been done for this patient, and there was we found that there was active growth on the right, uh, the left condyle. Okay. So, uh, and regarding the values as. Uh, if there is a, uh, you can see compared to the right to the left, right is somewhere around, the right to uptake was somewhere around 31.2 and the left is somewhere around 68.8 was the uptake. Okay. So anything more than, uh, as Dr. Sherry was discussing last time, it was more than 10 or something. I mean, it really relatively shows that there is a relative active growth taking up in that right, con I means left condyle over there. Okay. So the growth is still over there. Okay. Sherry, can you shed some light on this uh, Technetium 99 scan, the uptake? Yeah. The, the spect is, uh, there are two types of evaluation here, either a quantitative kind of evaluation or qualitative kind of evaluation. So uh, the, the advantage of spect um, is to get a quantitative kind of uh, evaluation, which is which has more reliability than the 
qualitative one. Um, and uh, the difference uh, should be when it, it is significant when the difference between them is more than 10. Uh, individually, and individually, you should be more than 55% of uptake on an individual, which shows significance. So this, I think, satisfies both of them because there's a difference of more than 10 between them. As well as an individual one, the left side has 68.8, which is much more, more than the cutoff line. Okay. And uh, in this case, what we have is, is, an, uh, is an older patient, about 20 years of age. Suppose in a younger patient, how will we go about this technician 99 scan? Because this is usually after the growth period, I think, what we would perceive Correct. as the growth period. Because yeah. with younger patient, how would we interpret these values? Uh, the fallacy, yeah. In a growing patient, there, is, there can be fallacies because the opposite condyme will definitely pick it up. Both the condyles will pick it up because the child, the, the, the individual is growing. Okay. So that can be a fallacy and hence it is uh, sometimes very difficult to distinguish uh, between it. Uh, and also it is difficult to distinguish between a bilateral situation. Okay. Uh, if both of them are hy uh, hypoplastic, okay. uh, between that and the patient who has a unilateral but the opposite side is growing. Because both will pick it up. Okay. Uh, that is where this relative uh, percentage matters. But it still could be a fallacy in a case of bilateral or it or an individual which is growing. Is it possible to differentiate between a, a, condyle, a tumor of the left condyle which is growing and the condylar hyperplasia using SPECT? I think the only way is to see that the quantitative pickup will be much more. I think that's the only way. Okay. And okay. correlating with, with the scans, because okay. the scan will show a absolute big size of the condylar size when compared to um, a type 1 or a type 2. Okay. So based on the vote for classification, if you look at the type 1, 2, and 3, and 4, okay. the 4 is where the tumor tumors lie. Okay. Uh, so I think if you correlate the uptake, with the morphological feature of the condyle okay. uh, uh, is the only way you can actually distinguish between a tumor without doing a histopathology. It means you have not gone in for surgery. Okay. Okay. Suraj, do you want to add anything regarding the class, the basic classification of uh, condylar hyperplasia? Dr. Shuri has elaborated that, and I think we'll go by that. Okay. Okay. So there are the. The observer classification, then you have this Woodford's, uh, this thing, and a Bishara's class. There are three classifications because the PG is to have a look at that. There are three ways of how these people describe it. So you have a uh, type 1 condylar hyperplasia and a condylar elongation. I think mean, there are that is a basic classification put forward by Obergeser and Mackey, which is usually asked for the PG exams. So I request the PG to have a look at it. So uh, in this case, uh, can can you, can you just go down the slide? Can you just show us the images, the CT images? Dr. Anju, please, can you show us the CT images? Yeah. So in this, uh, obviously, there is a definite problem with the left condyle, and the whole thing is being pushed to the right. Okay, so and the patient has been complaining this for past uh, few years. So I think uh, that is a basic thing. And uh, in the treatment planning, um, what else would you like to uh, consider? Of course, again, it's a case of facial asymmetry. Now the the there is a disparity in the uh, growth of the mandible as well as the uh, compensatory changes in the maxilla. So we need to. Start with few points like the how do you is do we need pre surgical orthodontics for these kind of cases? Uh, what is your take on that, uh, Manoj? Yes, the so many articles are there, uh, the regarding the there are so many controversies are there. Then, uh, initial uh, early ages, we go for the high condyle, uh, um, high condylectomy. 
will prevent the uh, more facial deformity. We can reduce the facial deformity in the early age itself. And uh, uh, that depends uh, upon the age of the patient and whether the uh, growth has been ceased or not. So many factors. So there are uh, single stage procedures are there. Uh, two stage procedures are there. And the single stage uh, procedure, we can do the uh, either go for uh, the initially high condylectomy or the high condylectomy followed by orthodontic treatment, high condylectomy followed by the orthognathic surgery, and single stage surgery by doing the virtual planning. We can combine, the, uh, we can do the uh, high condylectomy along with the correction of the facial deformities. These are the four types of treatments. Okay. Edward, do you want to add something on the staging of the procedure? Anything in your take on that? Yeah, staging, stage? it can be, uh, as Dr. Manoj said, or later. If you want to plan this particular case, you can either plan it in a multiple as a multiple stage procedure by first correcting the condyla hyper means the uh, correcting the asymmetry part with the resecting of the condyle, correcting the hyperplastic part of it so that your soft tissue and your muscles get adapted in such a way that you correct a bit of deviation of the mandible with your elastics and all. And once this settles down. You then plan your second stage of treatment as a regular orthognathic surgery procedure. Where, but the only factor what here it has to be considered here is you the patient has to go for a multiple procedures and the cost of it is going to be a bit. But that has got its own benefits. Second thing is if the patient insists, means of course the patient has to undergo the orthognathic treatment where you have to get a final occlusion regarding how it is going to settle up. But if the patient insists, or if there is a time uh, gap, means the time is limited, or if you don't have to, then a single stage procedure as body plan can also be done. But that also doesn't fulfill, or means completely fulfill your presume. You might have to have a uh, minor correction or something related on a second stage. But okay. I think it depends upon the choice of the surgeon, whom or the unit where you take it up because yeah, the yeah. second stage of procedure no is no just for discussion sake we are looking into the other options yeah that sherry, is the, yeah well, sherry what is your take on the single stage surgery versus uh, a staged one not necessarily right. uh, this is of condylar hyperplasia yeah. uh, we are talking about adults right yeah adults 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 right so that so adults means we are looking at non growing individuals so I would yes. divide that into uh, uh, one by severity. Okay. Now, uh, when you have a less severe prob skeletal problem, uh, it is easy to slightly less uh, difficult to handle that. So you may it is easy, you you may want to attempt it in a single stage if the time is constrained, like um, Dr. Edward had mentioned. Yes. Uh, you can do it with a single stage because um, the severity is less. So the deformity maybe can be corrected, which goes again for planning, but that's how you can look at it. But when you have a severe case in your hands, means the quantum of movement uh, in all the different three axes is much more, it is difficult to do it in one single stage. So you may end up having a residual problem, even in the best of hands. And that has to be anticipated by the surgeon because the patient will come back and say, I've still got a deformity and it can create problems. Okay. Uh, second thing is to reduce the severity or reduce the problems. Uh, if orthodontics is combined, there will be a lot of dental alder decompensation happening. So that means the severity again is reduced. It will, uh, your, the single jaw, so it might become a double jaw, it might become a single jaw. Um, or the amount of surgeries, like a lower border shaving, uh, might be saved. You may not need to do. Okay. Okay. So when you add each factor into it, the severity can be reduced, and the surgery surgical intensity can be reduced. So this will have to be balanced between the team uh, who is going to do it versus the requirement of the patient, based on the time and how much you can spend on it. Okay. And can you shed some light on the uh, pre-surgical orthodontics 
you might need in this case here. Yeah. Right. Um, again, uh, we we'll come back to the same thing. It depends on severity and it depends on all three axes. Some of these, uh, some of these cases. Uh, am I audible? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. So most of these cases have problems in all three different axes. Okay. So uh, I would look into each of these axes. Find out what is the skeletal deformity, okay. what dentalar compensation has taken place in that particular plane, okay. and try to decompensate. Okay. Uh, mostly in a facial asymmetry, in a hyperplasia, what happens is there is a vertical component, which is the challenging thing to correct. For example, if, if the mandible on the side of the condylar hyperplasia, there is an increase in posterior vertical height, yeah. leading to a op lateral open by tendency. So into the lateral open bite, the upper dentition will overrun. The lower dentition also will overrun. Okay. Sometimes the lower dentition overrupting is an advantage. But upper dentition overruption is a disadvantage, creating an occlusal cant on the maxilla. Yeah. So in such cases, uh, if you can intrude the extruded teeth, you may even sometimes skip one, one jaw surgery completely. Okay. Uh, but the orthodontist should be capable of intrusion, which is slightly difficult. But with today's uh, TADS, available, uh, availability of TADS and everything, this becomes more easier, which could not have been done before the pre-TAD era, which was very difficult to intrude. Okay. So now it's become easier. Again, intrusion of lower posteriors also is possible. So all these decompensations can be done uh, with relatively... Uh, good results today. And how will but we manage the, is, the yeah. general principles doesn't change. It's the diagnosis and treatment planning which is more important. It's okay. Okay. And what about the uh, midlines? Can you shed some light on the midline management in these cases? Yeah. The mid midline, the maxillary midline is relatively straightforward because you have only one dental midline and uh, one maxillary midline. So as long as you get the maxillary midline in place, and then correct the dental midline uh, into the aesthetic midline. It should be relatively simple. The problem happens is when, when you have and you try to deal with a mandible, you have usually three midlines. You have the aesthetic midline, uh, and then you have the midline of the of the mandible, that is the mandible body, and yeah. also the midline of the chin. Yeah. So the 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 midline of the body and the dentition which is literally in an osteotomy situation, it's a dentate segment. Okay. That has to be correctly placed in the position. But this may not tally with the bony midline of the chin. Okay. So hence, you may have to do a genioplasty separately to correct the bony midline of the chin yeah. into, to uh, align with the aesthetic midline. So this has to be appreciated right from the beginning. And the orthodontics should work in tandem to correct this. Okay. Otherwise, uh, we, we will end up doing an unnecessary osteotomy sometime. Okay. Okay. Uh, Suraj, uh, do you want to comment on something? Suraj? Uh, Shankar? Yeah. Yeah, this is Lata here. We have Dr. Maria, who is an orthodontist okay. among the participants. Yeah, Madam. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah she's joined. So, Dr. Maria? Yeah, I think uh, she's not there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, Suraj, do you want to add say anything to this? Suraj? Yeah, I think uh, regarding staging, I think the most important thing that I'll take into consideration is uh, the complexity of the surgery that we will be undertaking. Yeah. And, uh, I will stage it if it breaks down the surgery into simpler, uh, into simpler surgical procedures than it is in a one-stage surgery. So as... Uh, uh, Dr. Shelley very correctly pointed out if orthodontics could uh, lessen the surgical burden, then uh, uh, I would certainly uh, do orthodontics in order to save a procedure or to reduce one procedure or to reduce the complexity of the surgery. Okay. Yes, I have uh, three terms. One is hypondylar shape, hypondylectomy, and condylectomy. Okay. So, 
in uh, not specifically in this case when you have a case of condylar hyperplasia if it is in a growing stage what will be the uh, procedure that you would probably be doing i'm talking about 15 years 14 years 15 year old uh, patient uh, the panelists can join in anybody wants to comment on that am i audible Yeah. Yes, Senator. Yeah. Okay. Sherry, can you add some light on the uh, type of uh, whether to do high condylar shave, a high condylectomy, or a condylectomy? In which of these situations will you be doing? Okay. Yeah. Right. So, see, uh, in that, like you said, it, we are talking about a growing individual, uh, fourteen, yeah. fifteen kind of thing, right? Yeah. So the growth is not over. Yeah. So number point number one. we don't know how much this individual will grow nobody yes. has a clue okay but we know for a fact that if you let it grow yeah there is a high chance that it will overgrow and as it overgrows uh, dental under compensation will kick into place yes so you are talking about the condyle keeps growing the posterior vertical height will increase open yeah. white will increase yeah. uh, upper teeth will extrude lower teeth will extrude So yes. you are having, and you are having. So you are having. A, at the end of this, you may end up with a bigger deformity. Okay. Uh, so the question is, are you going to let it grow like this? Okay. And then manage a big, bigger deformity in the end, which might be more difficult. Will you wait for it to burn out? Maybe. Not. Yeah, you are trying to burn, let it burn out. But yeah. in the bargain, uh, you are going to get a bigger deformity to manage, which is more difficult, obviously. Yeah. Now. um let's take uh, two situations uh you have a, a condylar elongation versus a condylar hyperplasia so in el elongation what happens is the uh, it just elongates the yeah. morphology that is the buccolingual thickness uh, the posterior vertical height does not change okay is this basically and the occlusal plane also doesn't change much is but upper occlusal plane is more or less okay Okay. It just shifts towards to one side. Yeah. It's more a uh, horizontal growth problem than a vertical growth problem. Whereas okay. in a hyperplasia, a true hyperplasia, you got a bigger condyle. Posterior yeah. vertical height will increase. Yes. There will be lateral open bite. Midlines will not shift. Mostly, in most of the cases, the midline will not shift. It. The whole face will start to uh, oh. have a what is called as facial scoliosis. Scoliosis. It yeah. will start to shift. Okay, um, so that is a much more bigger problem okay. uh, than a elongation. Okay. So let's say you have an elongation in your hands. Okay. Uh, much easier to correct. And if you do cut off, in this case, the posterior vertical height is not much increased. Yes. The deformity is much less. You go and cut the condyle and make it smaller. Now yes. you increase the deformity. Rather than that, if you go and shave that. yeah uh, idea is to stop the growth okay you go and shave it the growth stops you are not created any more deformity yeah and high likelihood that it will stop growing okay, okay. you have to monitor this case okay to make sure that they are not growing any more forward so maybe the orthodontist will put in a functional appliance or start a fixed appliance and hold that mandible back so that it doesn't grow okay and monitor this case With, how many how many millimeters of the condyle are you taking are you taking going to take it out take out yeah, this is just shave means it's like few millimeters ah uh, 3 millimeters yeah okay. 3 millimeters max 3 millimeters 3 millimeters but when you have a huge condyle a big condyle you know that is hyperplastic yeah going and trying to shave the top 3 millimeter may not do anything major to stop the growth yeah even if it stop the growth you have a deformity there okay So in such cases, the condyle is huge and elongated, and it's a hyperplas hyperplasia case. Okay. I would I would I would go in and try to remove more. Okay. One the the Nixon talks about uh, taking the condyle uh, to an extent where it becomes symmetrical on both sides. Okay. Uh, that is one option you could do. Uh, yeah. Again, not fully proven, but these are followed by certain units. Yeah. But I think the key is to monitor this patient. Okay. 
because you might still end up in a, another deformity, but definitely less in intensity and much easier to manage. And if the orthodontics keeps an eye on it, this dentalar compensatory mechanism also can be slowed down. Okay. Okay. So, uh, uh, in this case, can we just uh, go down? What was the? Uh, can you see the uh, treatment planning that was done? Can you have a look at that? Yes, sir. Yeah. So we have a better idea of the maxilla and the mandible. Okay, next slide. Okay. It's a pretty huge condyle, yeah. Next slide. Uh, uh, Edward, can you just take us through this, Edward? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, considering this and thinking about the very after doing the bone scan, we found that the content was it means actively growing. Then we had no option just to uh, the condylectomy. So, um, keeping this in mind, we went in for a virtual planning. Okay. Uh, as done by Doctor uh, Manoj, who stated it. We did a, we did actually a CT, not a CBCT, and we okay. also sent it to setups where we had, uh, as I told you, we had something in our mind of what is to be planned. So, with keeping this in mind, we proposed our treatment plan of condylectomy, and we the the patient had a can with yeah. a maxillary uh, retrusion and a uh, shift towards the right side. So, we wanted uh, we asked them to do a condylectomy as well as advanced the maxilla with correction, correcting the can, the differential impaction over there okay. of the uh, right of being impacted a more compared to the left and then with a sag on the right side. So, and then they also gave us some suggestions and ideas, but uh, means I think we went in for a couple of discussions and then we came up with this particular idea and they one minute and just with this uh, they put in I mean they did a virtual planning and gave us how the occlusion is going to change and the uh, profile is going to look like okay keeping this in mind we thought we will go with this and then we start off planning how we'll be go ahead with this Okay. Should we go it in a single means as a multiple stage procedure doing it? And even I think I had a consultation with Dr. Pramod regarding the same. So where he suggested me go for a first stage procedure of condylectomy and then uh, go for the regular orthognathic correction now. But considering the patient scenario also, and means the patient was not that affordable, not affording to go for a multiple stage of procedure and they were insisting on whether they could do it and finish it up in single stage. So uh, we knew that was a tedious procedure and we have never done it <laughs> with the combined procedures, all these three, and we know the time, how much it is going to take me being the first scenario of having all these things corrected together. Anyhow, we thought we will move ahead, keeping this in mind. Initially, we went down with a condylectomy, then came down for the regular leaf out one osteotomy. We had this cutting guides and guides also given to us by setters where the guides pa only partially worked out for us. Actually speaking, sometimes it doesn't work and then you find it very difficult over there. With the intermediate splint, we just uh, went in with the, as I told you, we went in for the uh, condylectomy and then approached the lower, lower and the mandible but by making the cuts and keeping it ready for the lower uh, sads, just didn't split it up, went back, did the maxilla, did a differential impaction for the mains, uh, down fracture the maxilla, and then according to the splints or the cutting guides, keeping into consideration that the maxilla had to be taken up on the right side a bit more than the left side, we just 
section it, took it up, advanced it, and then keeping the intermediate spin, we fixed it up. Then we came down, correcting with the, doing the SAG on the right side, setting the deviation correction. And that is what I discussed. I mean, so I had, uh, even the uh, virtual planning was done, they gave us an idea regarding that there is going to be a player up on the right side with the proximal and the distal fragments as such. But actually speaking, when we went in with the procedure of the SAG, we didn't get a flare of the proximal fragment as such. And that was because I think we had this. I think we would have gone wrong or the condyl would have gone got adapted on its own, thereby preventing. Because what we planned is, if suppose we have a flare on that side with the proximal and the distal fragment, we should have gone for the, there was a lower border means there was also a plan for the uh, resecting means the lower border shaving or resecting a part of the lower border in order to correct that the, bo the body height was a bit more on the left side. So okay. we thought we'll just have that segment also in the proximity in between. But unfortunately, when I means fortunately, when we did a surge and when we tried to fix it, we found that there was no gap as such. And by the time <laughs> this was also done, it was also a pretty bit late. Then we just post me. We thought we'll just settle up with this particular all this three stage of procedure, and we'll see how much it settles, and then decide on whether any additional steps of correcting that uh, lower border correction for the left side or the anything. If there's anything there, we'll plan it for a second stage procedure later, and that is how we ended up. And right now, when we see the patient, we can see that there is a flattening of the left side, but a mild increase in the body height, I think, on the left side, which has to be corrected. And that is a minimal thing now. We can just augment it and do a shaving or whatever according to the second stage of planning. And yeah. that is how we ended it up. Okay. Thank you, Edward. Um, uh, Ma Manoj, do you want to add something, Manoj? Uh, if it is in an uh, early age, uh, it's better to go for the condylectomy and uh, I, I have already mentioned yeah. uh, uh, yeah. we can prevent the uh, uh, deformities and okay. uh, we can reduce the uh, further, we can avoid the further surgeries by simply doing the orthodontics. Sometimes we can correct the deformity. Okay. Uh, Suraj, you want to add something to this? And you can you just get the photographs of the post op occlusion? Yeah, I, I just have a concern regarding the uh, when we do these kind of procedures. I just want to take uh, two things. One is how do you manage the uh, anesthesia? What are the what are the things you will take into consideration when you plan the anesthesia for these cases? And two regarding the uh, need for blood transfusion what are what are the policies you follow regarding that can, Prashant, I, can I just uh, ask a question to joseph before you go to that uh one second prashant uh, just uh, uh, because uh, we are a bit late i just okay want, okay yeah just one thing yeah uh can uh who want to take uh, sherry any light on the anesthesia things that you uh would like to consider when you plan to do surgeries like this in surgeries so like this means uh, you're talking yeah. about condylectomy with... Uh, yeah, yeah, major case. A major case which takes <laughs> a lot of time and planning. Uh, operative time. Whenever you're planning for a case which takes... Uh, in this case, I think you would have taken more than four hours, I think, for this case. No? Definitely, yeah. So, uh, while planning this case for anesthesia, because there are PGs uh, also in this group. So, just uh, what type of anesthesia would you prefer? Do you have any preferences, uh, intubation, anything specific, anything, anything you want to look into the, yeah, uh, yeah, right. all that uh, planning thing though, because we are taking up this case for surgery. So uh, what are the anesthesia things uh, you would consider? What are the other parameters like requirement of blood for, for the, uh, for intraoperatively? How will you manage those uh, situations? 
Yeah, uh, I, for, I would. Uh, yeah. To me, yeah. uh, uh, the key thing is the preparation. Okay. Number one, I would plan my uh, splints and positions and everything, uh, okay. so that I take much minimum amount of time fiddling with the uh, segments which I have osteotomized because I don't want to speculate on it. I want to be accurate, so I, I should be having uh, different splints based on say whether it's a bimax, it's an intermediate splint, or a fine splint based on how much you want it. Okay. Two, I would get all the measurements written up uh, so that I can refer it while I'm operating. I don't want to again fiddle around and waste time. Uh, so talking about time, uh, I would like to. Um, um, prepare for any un unexpected bleeding, I think, so I would cross match and get bloods ready, okay. especially because the, the maxilla is involved yeah. and also a lengthy surgery is involved in that. Okay. And uh, regarding time, I would take it very seriously because I don't want to be tired at the end of this uh, procedure okay. because then if you think untoward happens, I should have enough energy to bail out myself out of that mess which I've created. Okay. Um, uh, so bl keep bleeding to the minimum. So I would uh, give a local anesthetic uh, infiltration yeah. as before I go and scrub so that the local anesthetic kicks in uh, by the time I come and drape the patient and get in and start cutting. Okay. Um, also, mm -hmm. uh, whether if steroids or any drugs to be given in the right time before I put the knife on the patient. Mm -hmm. And also uh, have a very good uh, rapport with the anesthetist and explain to them what I'm going to do at what point I'm going to do that. For, ex for example, I may want a, a slightly reduction in the blood pressure as I'm down fractured the maxilla. Okay. So I would tell them that time before I try to down fracture, I would tell them that I'm going to do it and it's going to bleed. So that if, in case they want to bring the blood pressure down, they, they have given enough time to do it. Okay. Okay. Routinely do you use hypotensive anesthesia? No, no, not routinely. But if it's a lengthy procedure, I would try to request for a hypertension. Not for the whole period. I don't want it for the whole period. I just want it only just after the maxilla comes down. Okay. Because at that's the time I want to just get things under control till I mm -hmm. get the, the bleeding under control and during that time. But I would, even if I ask for it, and they are maintaining the hypo. I would ask her to bring the blood pressure back before I finish the case up because I want to know where they're oozing from or if there is any oozing. I don't want the hypertension continuing on to the poster. Okay. Have you ever used autologous uh, blood transfusions? No, no, not me. No. Okay. Okay. Anything else, Manoj? You want to add something regarding the preparation part? I have uh, one doubt. Uh, what about the fate of the after the condylectomy and what is the fate of functioning of the TM joint? And if you keep the meniscus uh, disc after condylectomy. If there is a stump left behind, I think there would have been some, you could have done something about it. But other than that, I think uh, the you let the musculature and the guidance with the elastics to take care of it. That's all that you can hope for, I think. Uh, Suraj, you want to add something? Uh, now, for long procedures, of course, uh, there is the option of uh, hypotensive anesthesia, but uh, always, I, I always make it a point to get the, the BP right on track uh, before I plate the maxilla, because once I plate the maxilla, and if it is Waiting and the hypothesis is reversed, then later for the time and the time waiting for the post maxilla, it's very, very difficult. Uh, also, I make it a point to future the nasal mucus membrane if it was strong. Okay. It could, it could uh, uh, present bleeding late, especially during extubation. So, these are the two points that I would uh, like to put uh, Do you play surgery cell anywhere in the maxillary? Uh, are you doing a leaf for? Surgery cell or any other? Used to, I used to impact some surgery cell or even abgel uh, at, at the point uh, where the maxilla is in the new position posteriorly uh, in the pedagogic plates. But I do not know whether there is any evidentiary value to it, whether it stops bleeding or whether it produces any hemostatic effect. That is something that I do as a force of habit. Also, I used to keep some. Uh, 
agile in between the segments in the fast fit osteotomy whether it does anything good i am not very sure okay and uh, uh, can i can i can i ask a question joseph yeah 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 uh, dr joseph yeah can, can you hear me Prashant. yeah yeah you said yeah, you can, did a, you did a unilateral uh, right side bilat uh, sorry right side sagittal osteotomy am i correct yeah right uh, okay so what made you take a decision on that instead of the bilateral and did you do a junior plasty also in this case no no junior plasty was done on this case Okay. Why I went for a unilateral surgery? Because totally we are just going for a uh, condylectomy on the left side. Left so side. So anyway, your deviation and your elongation, the ramus increase, ramus height, and all is going to get reduced. But dear condyle, according to the precise measurements of what we have uh, planned earlier, we are just resecting the condyle. The con. Okay. So the right, the left side is going to get adapted and shifted towards its exact position. where you need to correct the right side sagittally in order to get a proper occlusion and that is what we planned during the virtual planning itself so, you, so how yeah so you could get... achieve you say you as you said you could achieve that without a left sagittal sag yeah we don't had to do yeah right correct okay and you didn't do a genioplasty also no no genioplasty was no. done for this case okay because considering that is an excellent result actually what you achieved Oh. Okay. okay. Only thing is, this left side has ah. got a mild flattening with the ah, ah. vertical length on the body. So, so what, what about what about the what about the left side mandibular body height? Did you do any shaving on the left side, uh, no, lower no, no, border? No, no, yeah, that, no. At that particular stage, uh, only these three: the uh, the ah. condylectomy, condylectomy, uh, lift one, but lift, uh, you need lower uh, side. Right, right. So okay. by the time it was somewhere around six, uh, five, six o'clock, you know, so we had to yeah, yeah, right. of course. Of course. Team. Yeah, yeah, so it's a long procedure. Oh. Anything which oh. comes up post settling, we will plan it on a second stage because that's are all small minor pro- means uh, compared to what we have done. It is uh, lesser invasive procedure. So we will just explain to the patient and. on the settling stage when the it settles of completely and when uh, we'll just decide on what exactly has to be done and then we'll plan accordingly so that was the right so, decision uh, can, can i intervene please uh, i think we have we have over shot uh, the time that has been a lot to us so i can take some closing remarks from the panelists you want to say something we'll start with uh, suraj suraj you want to add something we are closing this uh, presentation i so said we have crossed the time so can you you want to add something say something before we yeah, I, i i must uh, I, i must congratulate both uh, dr manoj and dr uh, joseph for what of jesus i think they have <laughs> so presented this case very very comprehensively and uh, we have had many uh, learning points from this so i congratulate uh, all of them and the uh, myself for that thank you okay. dr manoj Yeah. yeah thank you all uh, all the uh, panelists dr shari dr uh, suraj and dr edward for a, and the moderator especially the moderator dr shankar uh, leading the, the session very nicely and it was a very nice uh, uh, session thank you all uh, shari you want to say something yeah um uh, i'd like to congratulate both the both uh, dr manoj and dr edward for the excellent cases and uh, bringing up those points so that we could discuss them yes, yes. because i think that's the key in this session yeah. um and uh, fantastic results good work and uh, showed good team between orthodontists and surgeons so you are able to achieve some good results very good team work um uh, great and good discussion as well thank you very much yeah and uh, edro joseph anything you want to say yeah, yeah. And just a point I means uh, we just tried with this uh, case presentation just for two purposes one is for our own pgs to just pre- have a opportunity to present a case so that they will be more authentic when they are presenting it before the exam and second thing it's a learning platform for all of us if we have gone somewhere wrong we need to correct it and this is the only platform we will get discussing it with our own professionals correcting our mistakes or 
getting an appreciation of whatever we do all means to learn it's a learning curve actually yeah. so take this opportunity to thank all the faculty it means our panelists and the faculty the uh, uh, pg sir attended and the colleagues okay i i'd like to thank the panelists and to both uh, joseph edward and uh, manoj for letting us use these cases and uh, in no way we are questioning what they have done. we are just trying to discuss so that we also can learn uh, from the cases they have done that is the, the that was the reason for this exercise and i would like to thank the msi for giving us all this opportunity and i hand it over to the uh, secretary for Uh, thank you, yes. Shankar sir. Before yeah. we conclude, there is one question in the chat box. Yeah, yeah. Uh, regarding the yes. role yeah. of reduction, role of yeah. reduction, role of reduction. I will, I will, I will put it forward to the panelists. Uh, yes. The question was: Is there any role for reduction, uh, role of reduction, to prevent a uh, uh, relapse in uh, following BSSO? That was the question somebody has asked. Uh, who wants to take it? Suraj, you want to take that? Any role for reduction glossectomy to re reduce relapse in uh, following BSSO? Uh, one of one of the reasons for relapse is, of course, a large tongue, uh, but that is more of a, a dental relapse than a central relapse. So, uh, in which case, if there is a possibility of dental relapse, I would consider reduction glossectomy. But I think one of the most pressing things. Uh, that will contribute to uh, to relapse would be a uh, reduced airway space. So I think uh, in which case uh, we'll have to do uh, posterior lingual uh, reduction or uh, urethral plastic or whatever uh, to prevent it. So I think that this would uh, reduction to plastic would rank much less in eye conservation to prevent relapse than an airway a particular way. Oh, unless, of course, it's an exceptionally large tongue or something. It's a problem. Yeah. Okay. I think I hand it over to the secretary for further thing. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Yeah. So we have come to the end of the session today, and on behalf of AMC Kerala, I would like to thank the moderator, Dr. Shankar Vinod, our panelists, Dr. Sherry Peter, Dr. Manoj Kumar, and Dr. Joseph Edward. Also, the postgraduates for taking uh, the valuable time and meticulously preparing the case presentation. Uh, you, Miss Suraj, and Dr. Suraj, Suraj, Suraj. And Dr. Suraj. Suraj, and Dr. Suraj, sorry, sir. And I would also like to thank all the participants and those who shared their questions and doubts to make the programs more interactive. Thank you, Leda, ma'am, and thank you, Dr. Varun Menon, for coordinating the session. I hope all the participants will give us a Uh, feedback, both positive and negative things, so that we can improve upon our program next time. Thank you all. Yeah. Hoping for your involvement in our future programs also. Good night. Yeah. Bye. Good night, Good night and once Good again, night. thank you all. Thank you. Good night, all. Good night.